Hello, I'm Professor Sims, and this video is for the online hand washing, particle transmission, and epidemiology micro lab one. This is the first of 10 lab sessions included in my laboratory for the fundamentals of microbiology course. If you're currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and Moodle site for assignments and other course information. The online lab one learning objectives include modeling the scientific method, collecting and interpreting scientific data, testing the efficacy of hand washing as a control measure for pathogen transmission, performing experiments to illustrate microbial transmission via direct contact, and to learn more about epidemiology. Students will also learn to observe and describe bacterial colony morphologies and uh, understand your safety and disposal procedures, which are going to be included in your lab procedures for the, for the course that are located on Moodle. To begin with, it is important to understand the differences between normal flora and transient flora. Normal flora are microorganisms that normally live with you. Humans have, by some estimates, 10 times more bacterial cells than they do human cells. Uh, humans cannot survive without their normal flora, which are permanent residents of the body. They're usually not pathogenic, meaning they do not normally cause disease. However, normal flora can become pathogenic if they go somewhere they're not supposed to be. For example, Staphylococcus aureus is normal flora of the upper respiratory tract, but if staph gets into a skin laceration and then it gets into your bloodstream, all of a sudden you will then have a staph infection. Uh, normal flora compete with and antagonize non-indigenous species of your sweat and oil glands, the dermis, also your eyes, nose, mouth, throat, urethra, and intestinal tract. Normal flora is essential for intestinal health, digestion, and it also produces some vitamins that humans can't produce. For example, vitamin K and B12. Some normal flora can also produce their own antibiotics, which kill some non-indigenous species, including species that are pathogenic to humans. Transient flora are temporary residents of the human body. They are microorganisms that are transmitted from the environment or from other hosts. Unlike normal flora of the skin, which reside in the dermal layer, transient flora of the skin lives on the outer epidermal layer. Because the epidermis is quite dry and acidic, it's difficult for transient flora to reproduce and survive there. So transient flora are going to usually die off or get washed away, especially when employing good hand washing technique. Transient flora may be, but are not always, pathogenic. Skin is the largest organ of your body, and if, if it is intact, meaning with no lacerations or open wounds, your skin is an extremely effective barrier against infection. Regardless of whether or not a microbe is normal flora or a transient flora, pathogenic or not pathogenic, the skin prevents entry of microbes into the bloodstream where it can become detrimental to your health. Hand washing is the most effective way to prevent the spread of pathogens, including nosocomial infections. Nosocomial infections are those that are acquired in hospitals, healthcare facilities, or other hospital type settings. Nosocomial infections infect nearly 2 million patients and cause about 20,000 deaths per year. For example, in 2011, more than 720,000 hospital-acquired infections occurred in hospitals in the United States, according to the CDC. About 22% of those nosocomial infections occurred at a surgical site, and cases of pneumonia accounted for another 22%. Urinary tract infections accounted for an additional 13%, and then 10% were primary bloodstream infections. The most frequent cause of nosocomial infection is Staphylococcus aureus. Staph aureus is a normal flora of the upper respiratory tract. Uh, approximately 30% of the human population carries it, which does sound like a lot until you compare that to 75% of hospital and healthcare workers. The really tricky thing about Staph aureus is that not only is it ubiquitous, meaning that it's everywhere, um, but it 
can also survive on the skin for several weeks before becoming pathogenic or before displaying any symptoms of infection at all. So for experiment one, we're going to be testing the, e the efficacy of hand washing. But first I want to show you um, this figure here on the right. It shows you where most people tend to miss when they wash their hands. It's extremely important to learn the proper hand washing technique. Even good hand washers miss places like in between their fingers and the little cracks and crevices in the palms of their hands. So what is the correct hand washing technique? Well, it involves rinsing your hands first, then using an antimicrobial detergent or soap to lather the entirety of each hand. You want to make sure you pay special attention to the backs of the hand, between your fingers, under your fingernails, above your wrists, inside all of the creases of the palm. Don't forget to clean the area between your forefinger and your thumb and the thumb itself. This lathering step should take about 20 seconds by itself. If you're not sure how long 20 seconds is, it is about the length of time it takes to sing the happy birthday song twice. Finally, uh, you're going to want to rinse, and when you're rinsing, you are going to be performing the same motions like you want to be rubbing your palms together and cleaning in between your fingers and going up above your wrist. You do all of the same motions that you did for lathering. Do those while you're rinsing. And then you want to dry your hands with paper towels. If you're ever given a choice, say in a public restroom, uh, between paper towels and an air dryer, you always want to pick the paper towels because an air dryer, especially the ones in public places, are going to blow microbes right back onto your clean hands. The main objectives for experiment one are going to be to test the efficacy of hand washing when using the proper hand washing technique and to model the scientific method. The very first thing you want to do is formulate a hypothesis that you're going to test. So you want to make a predicted outcome that includes some rationale. For example, will your hands have more or less bacteria before you wash them versus after you wash them? Will it have less abundance? or will it have fewer species? What background information is leading you to believe this outcome? So if you think you're going to have more before, okay, that sounds logical, but why? So your hypothesis would be hands should have more abundant bacteria prior to hand washing because, and you fill in the because. You have to have some kind of rationale and then you have to have a way to test any hypothesis. So the way you're going to test this hypothesis is you are going to first prepare a nutrient agar plate using the nutrient agar in your lab kit and a also petri dishes in your lab kit. There's going to have detailed instructions, instructions inside your kit for doing this, but essentially you're going to have to melt the agar and pour it into the plate. And once you pour it into the plate, you have to let that cool and as it cools it solidifies and then once the agar is solid in the petri dish you have a nutrient agar plate that you can use making nutrient agar plates for this lab and for your future labs you can do it in advance if you like you can store uh, prepared plates in the fridge for about a month at a time um, but you want to make sure that you store them in a sealed container like a ziploc bag or something like that and you want to store them up upside down. That is with the lid on the bottom and agar on the top. And that's because you don't want condensation so that you're going to have condensation that forms in the plates because of temperature changes. Um, that condensation, you don't want it to collect on the surface of the agar. So we always store agar plates upside down. Once you have your nutrient agar plate, you're going to take a Sharpie and write a line on the bottom of the plate that is essentially dividing the plate in half. You'll label one half dirty, label the other half clean. Then you're going to have uh, sterile cotton swabs that are in your kit. You'll need those and you'll need some sterile water. To sterilize water, you're just going to take some water, your tap water, and you're going to heat it on the stove. It needs to be in a rolling boil for about one to three minutes. And then you allow it to cool to room temperature before you use it. So you're going to use a sterile swab in your sterile water. You're going to moisten the swab with the sterile water and then use that moistened swab to swab your unwashed hand. 
So you're going to swab the palm, your fingers, the area between your fingers, all those little spots that people tend to miss, you wanna swab. And then you're gonna inoculate the dirty side of the nutrient agar plate with this swab. You're gonna do it in a simple streak pattern. Now this shows a simple streak just across the whole plate. In reality, this plate's gonna be divided in half. So it'll be more like simple streak on this side for the dirty side, simple streak on this side for the clean side, okay. But I did wanna show this because a simple streak is just a back and forth zigzag pattern. We will be learning other streaking techniques later. So you're going to streak only half of the plate in this back and forth simple streak pattern. And you wanna make sure that you roll, you roll the swab across the agar surface. Don't press too hard into the agar because this will puncture it or it can cut it. Um, agar is kind of the consistency of jello when it's solid, so it can be damaged pretty easily. And then the next step is you're going to properly wash your hands as we described before. And then after you've washed your hands, you're gonna take a new sterile swab. You're gonna moisten it with sterile water and you wanna swab the same hand in the same places that you did the first time and use that swab to inoculate the clean side of the plate. Then you want to label, you can tape the lid on top and you don't wanna to use too much tape because you just wanna secure the lid, uh, but you wanna have enough, enough wiggling, I guess you could say, to allow for oxygen to get into the plate because what you're doing next is you're gonna allow this plate to incubate. You will incubate it at room temperature, so you just at regular temperature, you don't have to try to figure out any kind of 37 degrees or 98 degrees, nothing like that. You're just gonna keep it at room temperature. You do want to store it upside down even, even while it's incubating, okay? So you're gonna flip this over and incubate it upside down at room temperature, and that has to happen for 48 hours. So this is two days of incubation. You might wanna set this up early, so have plenty of time to incubate. You wanna put it in a place that's dark and also a, definitely a place that's away from food. After the 48 hours is up, you're gonna record your observations. You're gonna answer all of the guided questions in the lab report, one template. We'll discuss towards the end some, some more observations you wanna make. But for now, I wanna discuss particle transmission, how we will observe it in experiment two. In order for a pathogen to persist, it has to put itself into a position in which it can be transmitted from a host to a new host. Modes of transmission include direct contact, indirect contact, droplet contact, airborne transmission, fecal-oral transmission, and vector-borne transmission. Direct contact transmission is self-explanatory. You have to touch it. Indirect contact transmission usually involves a contaminated object or a fomite. A fomite is an inanimate object. Fomites facilitate ind indirect transmission when they come into contact with a particulate and subsequently come into contact with the host. Then you have droplet contact. This generally refers to pathogen transmission via coughing, sneezing, and breathing too close to someone, that kind of thing. A single sneeze can send thousands of virus particles into the air, and I've seen it go up to about 20 feet. But in, for something to be considered an airborne pathogen, it needs to be transmittable in, in the air further than one meter. And this generally doesn't necessarily include a sneeze, okay? This is something that can live in the air. So it's not just somebody coughing in your face. It has to be able to travel over a certain distance and survive in the air on its own for a time. Fecal oral transmission, which is just as gross as it sounds, uh, these are waterborne pathogens that are shed in feces, and then they're ingested by a host that is consuming the contaminated water. There's a very good video that I've put in the description of this video that explains how cholera is transmitted. Uh, cholera is an example of fecal oral transmission. And then of course you have the vector-borne transmission. This is when you have an animal that's transmitting the disease from one host to another. The easiest um, example I could give of this would be malaria. Malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes. Pathogen that rely on insect or arthropod vectors for transmission exit the body in the blood as that blood is being extracted by a biting insect. 
So your experiment two learning objectives include illustrating microbial transmission via direct and indirect contact. And once again, you're going to be testing the efficacy of hand washing to remove particles from your hands. We do this by using the glow germ powder. Glow germ is a non-toxic powder that simulates microbes. They're like little pieces of plastic. But when I say little, I mean they are the size of individual yeast cells. So a little bit bigger than bacterial cells, but not, not a whole lot. And the fun thing about them is that not only are they simulating these particles by being the same size, but they are able to glow under UV light. So you can see where they are and you can see where they get transmitted and picked up and things. Make sure when you're using this glow germ powder that you are using a very small amount because, oh, and by the way, it's, it's in your kit. The glow germ powder and the UV light are both gonna be in your kit. But you want to use a very small amount. Don't, don't go crazy with the glow germ because a little bit goes a long way and it can get a little bit messy. You'll see when you start using it. You'll see what I'm talking about. So what you do is you put a small amount of the powder on the palms of your hands and you rub your hands together and use the UV light to observe and record the approximate percentage of the palm surface that is covered in the simulated germs. Then you're going to touch a surface with your palm and then observe the surface, record how much of the germs transferred to that surface. And then finally, you're going to thoroughly wash your hands as we have described before. And you're gonna observe and record the approximate percentage of the glowing germs which still remain on your washed hands. And you may very well be surprised by this result. Have a look here at this quick glow germ demonstration. As you can see, the germs glow blue under ultraviolet light. Now what happens if I touch something like this coffee mug? Some of the glow germs get transferred from my hand to the mug. And this is just how real germs spread every time you touch something. Now I've just washed my hands. So we'll turn the light off again and see how well I did. Look at that. I missed whole patches of germs. Finally, uh, experiment three is going to be looking into epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study of occurrence, transmission, frequency, distribution, prevention, and control of disease in human populations. Epidemiologists are essentially disease detectives whose major concern is developing methods to prevent pathogen transmission. Some epidemiological terms to know are endemic, epidemic, pandemic, right? And so not only do you want to know these terms, but you want to know the difference and similarities between them. So your endemic level is the baseline, right? This is the level at which a pathogen is prevalent in a population or a geographic area at regular normal times okay an epidemic is when a pathogen increases suddenly and it's a factor of time a pandemic is when you have an epidemic right so you have a pathogen that is increased in a short time but it's not just a factor of time it's mostly a factor of space a pandemic is an epidemic that's occurring over a large geographic area it's also important to understand the mechanisms by which pathogens enter the body, especially for when you're doing your lab, so you can consider these things for safety reasons. So you have lacerations, scrapes, rashes, dry skin, hair follicles, sweat glands. We, we've already talked about skin as being a protective barrier. You can have bacteria that not only enter your lacerations, but also pores and sweat glands. You probably have heard of acne, right? So this is when bacteria have been trapped in your pores. But you also have things like hookworm. Hookworm can penetrate the skin. So in that case, the, the barrier kind of breaks down there. Uh, you have exposure via breathing in airborne pathogens. So you've got the respiratory system, which is a mechanism through which pathogens enter. There's airborne transmission, also back your uh, droplet transmission, that kind of thing. You do kind of have a backup system. Your body produces mucus, which serves the very practical function of trapping pathogens, especially in your lungs and upper respiratory tract. Also, you can ingest contaminated food or drinking water, and also uh, touching the mouth, biting your nails, chewing on pencils. You generally want to avoid putting things in your mouth. Don't put your fingers in your hands and stuff in your mouth. 
For experiment three, all you're going to need as far as materials is a computer or other internet connected device. What you're going to do is observe and interpret scientific data in order to determine the source of an epidemic. So you'll complete an online simulation provided by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. The case study is called Midterm Revenge and it's located here at this website. You'll read through all of the clues, being sure to take note of them all, especially including the attack rates and control data that's included in clue number four. That's going to be important, especially for completing your lab report template. Here is a short video showing how to navigate the site. As for the safety guidelines, you want to make sure that you keep all of your lab specimen and reagents away from food and drinks. Disinfect your counters at least an hour uh, before using those counters to prepare food. You want to disinfect the counters and surfaces that you're going to be using for your labs before and after performing lab procedures. If you have access to PPE, it is highly recommended. You want to make sure that you carefully read through your procedures. These are posted on the Moodle. Don't forget to keep them nearby. Carefully read and follow those instructions. And treat all specimen as the potential pathogens. Um, before you throw anything away in the trash, make sure you decontaminate your plates and seal up the plate before you throw it away. And I already talked about waiting for an hour after disinfecting the surface before using it for food preparation. For your observations and interpretations, for the first experiment, you want to make note of the abundance and or diversity of the microbial growth before and after hand washing. How many different colony types are present? Was your hypothesis supported or rejected? For experiment two, you're going to be looking at your hands after glow germ and what areas did you miss? How could you improve your wa hand washing technique? How did the uh, particle transmission compare to what you expected to happen? And for experiment three, were you ably, able to successfully trace back the infection to its source? And how did you do it? You need to be specific about the steps. So again, make note of the steps that you're taking and the clues that you get. What were the recommendations for reducing further infections in the future? Here are some terms that are used for describing colony types, also known as colony morphologies. So just a few here, if we've got elevation, margin, whole colony, and then different terms to describe those. So when you have uh, bacteria growing on a plate, you can, you can see them with your naked eye, okay? You don't need a microscope. But what you're seeing are not cells. These are colonies. They're large aggregations of cells. And these types of observations, these colony morphology observations, are often the first step in species identification. When you're recording the results of your hand washing and ubiquity plates, you'll want to be able to describe what may, at first, look like just a bunch of dots 
on a plate. But if you look a little closer, are those dots all the same color? How do they differ in size? Are some of them smooth and round? Maybe others are more irregular, or maybe some are filamentous? These are the types of descriptions that you're going to want to include in your lab reports. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your comments for me in the comments section below.